Camino Cantina. How are y'all doing tonight? Hey, Patio. How you doing up there? Hello? Hello? Well, thank y'all for coming out tonight and grading the first below 50 degree evening. I know that's bitter cold for us in Texas, so thank you for coming. Um, is this anybody's first meeting tonight? Raise your hand. First meeting? First meeting. Awesome. So we're Texas Normal. We're 100% volunteer run. We're an educational nonprofit. We have a mission to move the public opinion forward sufficiently so that we can legalize responsible use of marijuana by adults. We want to serve as an advocate for consumers to assure that they have high quality cannabis, that it's safe, convenient, and affordable. That's pretty awesome, right? That's a good thing we want to do. So tonight I have lovely Miss Susie. She will be our ASL interpreter. So let any of your friends know that we do have ASL interpreters and they can have all their friends come and be able to learn a little bit about cannabis news. All right, so back over there, we've got our merchandise table. You can become a member, get some good educational information. You can also join up for our monthly newsletter and we'll send you um, also action alerts whenever it's the legislative session. So, let's get on with the news. Let's start with global news in London. So I had to look up some of these words, you guys. Excuse me if I mispronounce them. So the concomitant, or the natural association and accompaniment, got that? Concomitant, did I pronounce that right? This is the administration of various non-psychoactive plant cannabinoids. They demonstrate a synergistic anti-cancer activity in human leukemia cell. So synergistic means that together you have something good, or one thing is something good, but you join it with another, and it's even better and more powerful. So what this is discussing is that there are three different types of non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Let's see if I can say these right. Cannabidiol, cannabigerol, and cannabigerin. <laughs> Right, you guys. These respective acids, uh, they work on two different types of leukemia cells, and they have a mildly additive synergistic interaction, which means that basically if you were to only extract one and let's say only have cannabidiol, it would be less effective as, a, as if it was with its two other cannabinoids. So the three together are going to be more powerful. Authors conclude that our findings indicate that cannabinoids act with each other in a way that such doses for therapy could be reduction without significant loss of activity. This study adds further support to the idea that cannabinoids can have a role in the cancer setting, not only as single agents, but also in combination with each other. So, in Bern, Switzerland, they have now reduced minor marijuana possession to a fine only offense if you have less than, let's see, I think it's 10 grams. Yes, less than 10 grams, and if you're over the age of 18. So that's another move forward in the global war against the war on drugs, if you will. Also in Jerusalem, Israel, they have been looking into legalizing retail production and sale of cannabis. They estimate that it would bring in an approximate $450 million annually. They think that this is because of the existing Israeli marijuana market. They total some $704 million annually. Then if they also tax the yield, that would be another $207 million annual revenue. And then if on top of that, they change the law so that it was decriminalized and people didn't have to be in jail, they would save an additional $197 million just on prosecutorial costs. So that's pretty awesome. Now, I don't know if you know, but in Israel, they're doing a lot of really great research on cannabis. So they have a lot of therapeutic research and therapeutically accepted means of using cannabis. In fact, they have vaporizers in their hospitals. How awesome does that sound? But only 26% of the Israelis actually endorse social use, so recreational use. Um, now let's go to national, American national news. The Gilead's Gallup poll was released, and it says that 58% of Americans support legalizing marijuana. That is an all-time high, you guys. Just to give you some context, in just one year, 
that's gone up 10 points. So in 2012, they were only at, what was it, 48%, and now we're at 58%. And then historical facts, back in 1969, only 12% of people were in favor of legalizing cannabis. So we've come quite a long way over quite a long span of time. Um, in San Francisco, they have done a poll that says that six out of 10 Californians are likely to support making cannabis legal. They want, um, the percentages are even higher if, if you include polling in firm favor of adult use for uh, possession of cannabis. Also in California news, the Democratic Governor Jerry Brown signed into uh, legislation the California Industrial Hemp Farming Act. Yes, it's pretty awesome, we love hemp. So another random fact, I'm gonna digress. Uh, back in the 30s, Hemp was foreseen to be the next billion dollar crop for Texas. So imagine how awesome that would be if we could start growing hemp here, where even back in the 30s they were saying we would make billions on growing it here. I would be interested to see how much money we could make nowadays. But um, basically this measure reclassifies varieties of cannabis containing minute percentages of THC, which is the main psychoactive compound in cannabis. This plant is usually used for fiber, um, textiles, papers, etc. But this measure stipulates that hemp cultivation shall not take place in Florida or in California until such activity is also authorized under federal law. So basically, they're saying we want to grow hemp when the federal government tells us it can. So hopefully, the federal law will change soon. And there actually is um, a federal law or some federal legislation, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, and what it wants to do is to amend the Controlled Substances Act to exclude hemp. Basically, cannabis is classified as a Schedule One drug. That means it has no medicinal value. It is highly, highly addictive. I know, boo, they don't know what they're talking about. But since they say that hemp, which has almost no THC in it, is the same as cannabis that people may use medicinally, therefore you can't grow hemp because it's considered a Schedule One drug even though you could smoke a field of it and you would never have any effect except for you'd be dead from smoking away from problem. <laughs> um, and also, just so you know, Texas Representative Stockman has signed on to this federal bill. So a Texas Representative has signed on to a federal bill supporting um, industrialized hemp. So that's a really big deal in Texas. Um, in Colorado and Vermont, actually, they also have just enacted some industrial hemp laws. However, they don't wait on the federal government like California is. They're ready to grow now. In fact, I believe it was in Colorado that they've already had their first um, harvest of their hemp field. So that's really exciting that that's starting in, in America now. So a little bit of more, more, more news. In Washington, D.C., the U.S. Supreme Court has declined to review a lower court ruling which upheld the federal government's classification of cannabis as a Schedule I prohibited substance, substance that lacks medical utility and adequate safety. So we were just talking about Schedule I and how it prevents us from to be able to study it, be able to grow hemp. Well, there was um, a, an action that was being brought before the Supreme Court. Basically, petitioners had requested a hearing to determine whether existing scientists science contradicts the federal categorization of cannabis as a Schedule One. The D.C. Court of Appeals affirmed the DEA's position that insufficient clinical studies exist to warrant a judicial review of cannabis federal prohibited status. The U.S. Supreme Court denied an appeal to review that decision, rejecting the petitioner's argument that adequate peer review studies already exist sufficiently to contradict the, the plant's placement as a Schedule One. However, I mean, we all know that there's been multiple studies that have been coming out since the early 2010s that have counteracted everything that the DEA says. In fact, the DEA is actually reversing its opinions on uh, mandatory minimums and all of that type of stuff. So hopefully the petitioners will not give up and they will bring that before the U.S. Supreme Court again and perhaps we can get a hearing on it next time around. Also in Washington, D.C., 
as you know, they have uh, legalized medicinal cannabis in Washington, Washington D.C., which is ironic after the last story that I just read. Uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has approved two clinical trials to assess the e efficacy of cannabidiol, a non-psychoactive plant cannabinoid, in the treatment of in intractable pediatric epilepsy. So if any of y'all have watched the recent CNN documentary, um, Weed by Sanjay Gupta, you'll have seen Charlotte, and you'll have heard a little bit about Charlotte's plant, um, it, or Charlotte's Web. It's a plant that they grow that's cannabidiol, um, high in cannabidiol, CBD, and it basically took her from being catatonic, 300 seizures in a week, to being a functioning little girl who can run around and play, all because of cannabis. So the war on drugs is also a war on the health of our children, and we have to keep that in mind at all times. It's a war on our personal freedom, it's a war on our medical freedom, and we're not going to let the government tell us what we can put in our body and how we're going to treat ourselves and our children for illnesses. We want to have a safer alternative, and this is one of them, and in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, they're having two clinical studies to study that. So I think that the tides are turning, and people are becoming indignant on how slow it's moving, so hopefully we can really get this ball rolling. Um, additionally, in Alexandria, Virginia, the National Association of Specialty Pharmacy has announced its intent to establish a task force to better educate pharmacists on the management of cannabis therapy. They say, and I quote, medical marijuana has come to the forefront of patient care and many of the diseases that specialty pharmacists treat, such as multiple sclerosis, cancer, HIV, and others. More education for physicians, pharmacists, and patients is needed to ensure that individuals receive the correct product with the correct efficacy and drug delivery system to fit their disease. As an organization, NASP believes that it has the responsibility to let intellectual advisors and the obligation to take the lead on this emerging area of medical care. So there's an organization that wants to go out and educate people about what kind of cannabis you should take for what diseases you have, how you should imbibe it or ingest it for what you have, and then follow up uh, probably information for doctors and patients. So I think that that's a really awesome move forward right there. So now let's have the local news. Austin, Texas, right here where we are today. So recently there was a poll, and basically six out of ten Texas voters support legalizing marijuana and regulating its production and sale in a manner similar to alcohol. 58% of Texans. So 58% of respondents say that they support changing Texas law to regulate and tax marijuana similarly to alcohol, where stores would be licensed to sell marijuana to adults 21 and older. 61% of Texas voters say that they support decriminalizing minor pot offenses and replacing the existing uh, p uh, penalties with civil fines. Um, but you'll remember this past spring we had HB uh, 184 and HB 594. You know, the numbers aren't together, but I'm pretty sure that those were the numbers of the bill last year. And one of them was to lessen, or it was a decrim bill to lessen um, possession charges, and there was also an affirmative defense bill for medical cannabis. Um, neither of those passed, unfortunately. However, we're seeing that Texans are ready for it. If 58% of Texans are saying that they want to regulate cannabis like alcohol, that's pretty amazing. And back in 2004, there was another poll that said Texans support, 74% uh, of Texans support medicinal cannabis. So I think that the tides are really changing in Texas. And to those people that say Texans are going to be last, I say, bullshit, it's not going to be last, we're not going to let that happen, there is support, yes we have a really crazy system here in Texas, legislators only meet every two years for a couple months, the only ways that we can change the law in Texas is through the legislators, so we have to make our vote count for who we vote for, we need to be voting for cannabis friendly um, candidates, and we'll have a 2014 Texas Normal Voters Guide for you to review. Um, and also, just so you know, we can't change a law at a local level here, you guys. We have to change it at the state level. So that, that's what we're working with. It's, it's an uphill battle. The people support it. We need to make sure that the representatives know that the people support it. And we need to bring them scientific evidence and testimony. Um, we're going to be having 
2015 is the next legislative session. So that's the next time that we'll be having the ability to actually have a law introduced. And we recently joined with MPP, who actually uh, were the people who funded and, and, and did this poll for Texas. And we've created a lobby campaign. And we have hired the third uh, largest lobby firm in Austin. And they are going to be working with us to identify representatives and senators that will support bills for legislation, for uh, legalization, medical cannabis use, and decriminalization. So we're really, really excited about that lobby campaign. And if you do have a chance, please go up to the table and you can uh, find a slip there to donate. Or you can go to www.texasnormal.org slash lobby and you can donate there. So that's all really good news for Texas. Um, and then I want to go over some breaking news. As you guys know, yesterday was election day. If you didn't see those, I would like to bring you up to date on it. Portland, Maine became the first city on the East Coast to legalize marijuana. <laughs> Hooray, cannabis. Uh, voters approved question one by a margin of 63. This removes all penalties for possession of up to 2.5 ounces of marijuana by adults 21 years and older. That is awesome. Keep it up. Now for Colorado, voters approved a state about 65 to 5 passed two passes on legal marijuana sales. Proposition 8A was referred to the ballot by the General Assembly in accordance with historic legislation that was enacted a year ago. So now, I think this is really awesome because the federal government can figure out how it's going to get its piece of the pie because you know that's what they care about. So they want to see how Washington and Colorado plays out and let's hope that it plays a beautiful symphony to their pocketbooks. And then in Michigan, voters on three cities in three different cities adopted initiatives to remove local penalties for adult marijuana possessions. So in Lansing, Jackson, and Ferndale, cannabis has been legalized. And in Lansing, it passed by 62%. I'm seeing a lot of 60%. 60% of Californias want to legalize cannabis. 60% of Texans want to legalize cannabis. 60% of Americans. So as you guys see, we're, we're hitting that tipping point. It's just a matter of time, and we're going to be there. So real quick, we're going to take a break, and we're going to hear from Ms. Cheyenne Weldon. She's our guest speaker. She's the Texas Normal Executive Director, and she's also the Outreach Program Director for NWA. If you're wondering what NWA is, it's National or it's Normal Women's Alliance. She's going to speak to us about Stop CPS, or Stop Charit Child Parent Separation. That is a huge show. <laughs> I know, not exactly something you want to talk about, right, Jax? Jax has a child. We're all taking risks here. And there are groups of people that want to make sure that people are aware that this is a risk for parents. And that, that it shouldn't be. That our government shouldn't be looking into parents' uh, lives and removing their children based solely on their use or possession of cannabis, a plant that's non-toxic. And that is what I want to talk to you about. So thank you, Jax. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'm sorry to get serious for a moment, but even though we all know that there are very few actual side effects to cannabis, there are many to the drug war. And one of the ones that we as freedom fighters may not think about sometimes, especially if we're not parents, we think about that we should be able to do what we want with our own bodies. And that's great, and that's a reason to fight. But so are these other side effects of this failed policy. Because the failed policy of prohibition Tri trickles down into all these other policies. You have drug policies at work that prevent people from being able to have the jobs that they should, and then you have policies that say that all use is abuse, and that means that you're abusing your children by doing something while they're asleep and they're not harmed, while they're fed and clothed and in their bed. You being in possession of a plant somehow means that this government agency is able to come into your home through the report of an anonymous person who are you not or don't even get the chance to face and your whole life gets investigated and your children taken away. That has to stop. So it's another reason that we also can't just focus on medical. We all want to help patients. 
Medical is beneficial. Medical is a priority when that's what you can get through. But as Jack said, we're getting to the tipping point with legalization where everyone, no matter what your medical condition, you don't have to be dying, you don't have to prove that you're dying or have a terminal illness. That would be for all patients. But, and that is the answer because parents in states where we have medical laws already passed are, not, are still being targeted sometimes. Their children are still being taken. And if anything, a medical registry in a state where you have to say, I am a patient, by the way, and oh yes, I do have kids. Come and look at my garden. Well, guess what? Then they might come back and say, oh, you're breastfeeding? We might just take your child then. That puts that child into the foster system, puts the parent into the criminal system, and does nothing to help our society or that family. This is supposed to be child protective services? I don't think so. Basically what they're doing is having incentive to find more clients. They want government funding just the same as the law enforcement officers that uh, reap the benefits of asset seizures, that reap the benefits of grants, federal grants through even misdemeanor arrests, and they can target drug users. That's a law in the books that we all know is scientifically invalid, but it's there. And if you're a criminal, then you're, you're, you don't have rights to your children, according to the state, if they get this agency involved. They will start looking at every area of a parent's life, not just cannabis use. They want that money that they get for those children. So until, it, until we're all free, it's not just about what we can smoke or what we can grow or what we can medicate with, but families that are getting separated. And it's, it's CPS coming in and taking children away, and it's our criminal justice system taking parents away. We have a survivor of child-parent separation here tonight. It wasn't um, through CPS, it was through the criminal justice system, but if Bridget is here somewhere, I know that she will share her story with you. And it's just unfortunate and something that we all need to think about in our, our quest for justice for ourselves and freedom for ourselves. Um, that should also include the freedom to be a responsible parent and not have this one category looked at as if it reflects your entire parenting skills. The resources that are being spent on these children that are in otherwise safe and happy homes could be better spent on children that are in actual harm's way. And we know that they are out there. So the agency should not be in charge instead of finding children that live in a home where there's a plant that is perhaps ingested after they're asleep, like parents of Alexander, Alexander and Hill, who is a two-year-old here in Texas, and her father admitted that he smoked cannabis while she was asleep in another room. She was found to be in perfectly good health and cared for and not under any influence of any substances and they took her away and they put her in one abusive child uh, foster care home and when the parents saw how abusive that was they asked that she be removed and the system is so broken that she was then put into a home where she was killed by her foster mother for of all things getting into the food that the state or the federal government paid for them to have because they had no jobs and that was their job to take money from the government to take care of this child that had been taken from her parents. And that should certainly never happen. So some of the groups involved in legalization are trying to raise awareness to this aspect of the, the symptom of the drug war of parents being taken away from their children, of futures being limited by these laws, and just the overall effects that it has on our, on our society. Uh, so Moms for Marijuana is one of the groups. They're an international group, and they are kind of heading up this, this um, call to action. And the first of several rallies is taking place here in Austin. So this is, like I said, an international group, so there will be worldwide rallies associated with this. We have flyers at the table. Please take some. It's next Tuesday, November 12th at 5 p.m. at the Southwest Capitol grounds. So we're meeting uh, in front of the Capitol basically at 5 p.m. on Tuesday. That's the, the side where we hold our rallies. If you've ever been to the Texas uh, Normal Marijuana March that we hold in May, by the way, plug. Uh, <laughs> But it will be there, and it's the, if you look for a landmark, it's the one with the cowboy on a horse. It's that statue. 
Um, and Moms for Marijuana is doing this along with you know, the Normal Women's Alliance, which I'm a part of, and various different normal chapters and other groups like uh, PACT, which is um, our director of patient outreach group, is supporting this effort also. So we're basically just all teaming together to bring awareness to, uh, to this aspect of the drug war tragedy. We'll have speakers from several groups. I'll be there to speak, the founder of Angel Eyes Over Texas, and four parents who have been affected and fought this system and got their children back. And I can tell you that even when they do, there's a woman that I helped, if you were here a year, about a year ago, that I helped with her CPS case. She's homeless right now. She's staying with a friend with her children. And in, in going to all of her CPS appointments and making all of these uh, to the therapist, to the agency, every, to the court hearings, she lost her job. So she now has no way to um, fend for the children that she got back after representing herself against the state. So we'll hear from them, and please just recognize this effort, recognize that this is an effect of the drug war, and I'm sorry to bring everybody down, but you know, this is something that no other child should have to deal with in the future. No other child in our future should have to grow up like Bridget did, where she had to take control of her siblings as a teenager because her mother was taken away. No child or parent should be taken away for the use of a plant that has never caused a death, ever. And we're not policing people for alcohol, for prescription drugs, for anything, just because those are legal substances. So there are many reasons why this should no longer be contraband, and if you can't get on board with that one, I bet you can tell someone else about it who isn't willing to smoke, and it's something that you can sell them on. It's something that other people can see is wrong with this system, because it's this is something that's not just about cannabis. This, this agency is supposed to be helping children that actually need their help, not being incentivized to get federal grants and money. Thank you very much. Please take several flyers for the table to be attended. serious side effect of the failed war on drugs. It's, it's pretty sad, some of the stuff that happens out there, but I'm going to bring it back to some fun stuff with some events, you guys. So here we go. Texas Normal, we're awesome. We do really fun events. I don't know if any of you guys are at the Members Mixer, but she had an awesome outfit. Yeah, she did. And then recently at Flamingo Cantina, last Friday, we had our 8th Annual 6th Street Smokeout. It was awesome. We had really great music. So there's a couple things coming up that I want to tell you all about. There is an event that we're not hosting, but we are working um, a table at their event, and it's the Students for Liberty Austin Regional Conference. It's going to be this Saturday, and it's free to register. It has speakers, panels, breakout sessions, and it comes with three free meals. So you can go for free to a really awesome event to learn about liberty, check out Texas Normal, and get fed. Um, also, we have Race for the Cure this Sunday at 10 o'clock. Have you guys ever heard of Team THC? Team Hope Through Cannabis. This is what we do. We bust the cannabis stereotype. We are not a bunch of lazy pothead stoners sitting on our couch. We like to raise money for good events. We have raised money for Walk to End Alzheimer's, Race for the Cure. We've done uh, the Reindeer Run. So if you would join us this Sunday, the 10th at 7 a.m. on 16th and Congress, we will all be wearing our cannabis gear. We do have Team THC shirts and tanks for sale at the table. That's what a lot of the team will be wearing. Um, and then we've got Stop Ch Child Parent Separation. That candlelight vigil is going to be on Tuesday the 12th at the Capitol, as Cheyenne mentioned. Yes, Cheyenne? For Race for the Cure, they don't, if they can't register, if they don't want to walk or register, we do the uh, cheer teams, too. So if you don't want to walk, because you can totally walk, you guys. You don't have to run. I'll oh, be yeah, walking. I'm walking. You can, I'm walking. <laughs> you can walk with me. I'm walking. But I mean, if you don't want to pay and register. You can also join a cheer team. So you don't have to pay and register. You can show up in your cannabis gear with your cannabis sign, and you can stand and go, TTHC. All right, and then, so this is our open meeting. We do this the first Wednesday of every month. We also have something that we call our Texas Normal Strategy Meeting. We have it the third Wednesday of every month, and this Wednesday, or it's gonna be on Wednesday the 20th this time around, and it's going to be in Cedar Park, and basically it's a traveling education strategy meeting where we talk about 
why, the, why we have to change the laws the way we have to, how we do it, and then where we can build on each other's education and, and activism knowledge. So please come and join us for that. And then we also have a family picnic and tour of the Capitol. You know, a lot of times the Capitol can kind of be a little bit intimidating if you haven't been there before. But actually, the Capitol is really cool. And guess what? You pay for it. You pay for the people who work there. You pay for the electricity that runs that building. So dang it, go there and get to know it and tell the people what you want when 2015 comes around for the legislative session. So we're going to be meeting at the Southwest Capitol underneath the bronze uh, statue of the cowboy on a horse. We're going to listen to some music, have some lunch. We're going to discuss how to change the laws. And then we're going to have a nice little tour inside. So that should be really awesome. And then uh, we also have a new group that our patient liaison has, uh, has originated. It's called PACT Patients Alliance for Cannabis Therapeutics. And basically what this group is about is about patients getting together in a safe environment where they can interact with each other and where they can learn skills to get ready to um, testify at hearings for medicinal, medicinal cannabis. And the first ever meeting is going to be on Thursday, December 12th at Jane and Joe's Coffee. So you guys should go and check that out. And then last but not least, a month from now, first Wednesday of the month, we will be back here at Flamingo Cantina. We will be discussing news. We will be discussing events. We will hopefully have ASL again because we love Miss Susie. And Mal Malice, always play for us. And we usually have some outlaw comedy. So that's really awesome. Make sure you join us next time. Um, did you guys forget your pen and paper to write all that down? Because there's sheets up at the table. I wrote it down for you. So why don't you go pick one up? You have no excuse to not come to those events. And I'm going to leave you with one last little tidbit. Texas Normal, 100% volunteer run. Everyone who is on the board is on the board because we deeply believe in this movement and in this cause. And we need help. Can you guys help us out? We're looking for a secretary. So this position's responsibilities include um, attending our monthly board meeting. You would create an agenda for this board meeting. You would take notes during this board meeting. And then you would upload those notes to our drive. Um, that's really it. It's kind of simple and easy, but it's really required to run our board. So if anyone's interested, please come up to the table. Once again, my name is Jax. So I'm Deputy Director of Texas Normal. If you have any questions, please feel free to come by and say hi to me. And on that note, stop by our table and let's get ready for some outlaw comedy, y'all. Thanks for coming.